Hello YouTubers, welcome to the last video in this chapter, chapter 26. Today we're talking about the Qing Empire in China and their dealings with the Europeans as they encroached into Chinese territory and kind of what that looked like and how that brought about change in China. Uh, first of all, let's talk a little bit about how the Qing Dynasty uh, was installed. We'll talk about um, problems that the Qing Dynasty experienced and then get into the Opium War uh, and kind of the, the rebellions yeah. that occurred. Thank you, Bruce. As a result of the Opium War and the new occupation by Europeans, particularly the Taiping Rebellion and the Boxer Rebellion and the kind of the goals of those rebellions. We'll look at uh, five key vocab words, uh, four, four key vocab words today. We'll look at Qing, the Qing Dynasty. We'll look at Lin Zhezhu. We will look at the Opium War, and then the Taiping and Boxer Rebellions. Uh, so quickly, first, how did the Qing Dynasty come to rule China? The, the Qing Dynasty was originally the Manchu dynasty that was north of the Great Wall in what's modern-day Manchuria and the Manchu rulers uh, grew to great power by the mid 1600s and were able to kind of sweep down into China and um, overthrow the Ming emperors who were weakening by this time and install themselves as the emperors of China and so they took uh, the title the Qing Daddy! dynasty yes Bruce oh I'll help you in just a second okay will you come here and help me Come here, let's look. They took the title of Qing Dynasty and... Come on up. You can look at yourself up there. Ah. And begin to rule China. So they retained a lot of the uh, Ming Dynasty's uh, officials, the leaders, and then a lot of the Chinese institutions like the um, examination system, uh, the bureaucracy, and then the, the higher level uh, Chinese bureaucrats were still allowed to keep their positions and so they were strategic yeah. in assimilating themselves into China. So after gaining the mandate of heaven and being accepted as the rulers, um, they started to run into some problems as time went on and some of these problems basically had to do uh, essentially with uh, first of all not being able to control um, corruption at the highest levels including kind of nepotism which means putting family members uh, making sure they get into into positions of power there was outright cheating on the examinations uh, there was a total neglect of social programs and public works and so those went unfunded and definitely hurt the people of China and so uh, the people of China were already in kind of a mess of sorts um, by the time the um, British had arrived and so the British were coming over in order well fresh off of imperialism of, of other areas notably in India where they were beginning imperialistic activities um, and also beginning to gain interest in Africa as well and so China was one of their places that they also wanted to control now China was already a fairly strong empire and China uh, had a great degree of control in trade because they had the most desired products, uh, particularly tea, that the British really wanted. And the only thing that the Chinese wanted from the British was silver and gold. They weren't really interested in anything else that the British had. So in order to solve this problem, the Chinese uh, were... Uh, well, the British started to cultivate opium in India and collect that opium and bring it to China as a trade offering. Now China was developing a problem uh, par partially because of corruption but also just a general social problem of opium use and opium dens and these became kind of havens for the elite and the um, the rich and it was kind of a, a a, a drug addicted society at least at the elite level and it was leading to kind of moral decay for the Chinese so this opium problem was capitalized on by the British who were happy to bring opium and trade it for Chinese goods instead of tea well the Chinese quickly became uh, aware that this was problematic for their economy and their society in general and so they outlawed opium and um, the uh, the Minister of Trade, Lin Zhezhu, was responsible for getting rid of the opium problem. And so he essentially 
destroyed the opium reserves that the British had brought over and placed in warehouses and other areas of trade in China. Well, when he did that, he really made the British upset, and the British, in response, essentially bombarded the Chinese coast and forced them to try to open up trade. Um, and so the British started the Opium War. The Opium War was essentially a war that was uh, payback from the British to the Chinese for destroying their supplies of uh, opium. And so the the Chinese lost the Opium War, needless to say. They had to sign the Treaty of Nanking, which basically said that they lost everything uh, and the British, not, not lost everything, but had to give up land and ports and areas for the British to basically control Chinese trade. And this started kind of the century of humiliation for the Chinese, who were not used to being told what to do by outside powers. And so the, the British essentially started opening up these new spheres of influence within China, where other European powers and non-European powers, uh, the, the Japanese among them, were able to go in and control areas of China. Well, this led to some interesting issues in China as well, because China was now in a position where they had to either attempt Western-style reforms and compete with the West and be more like the West, or try to retain kind of traditional Chinese values. And that's where these two rebellions kind of come into play. So the first one was in the 1850s, the Taiping Rebellion uh, took place, which was kind of a radical rebellion in an attempt to basically changed China from this very traditional Confucian uh, scholar gentry organized society into a much more modern and reformed and progressive Western style nation. Um, so the leaders of the Taiping Rebellion were attempting to kind of completely change the social and political structure of China uh, in an effort to westernize and uh, even Christianized China to a degree. This rebellion failed, but not before causing um, dramatic loss of life and, pub and, and social disarray within China. So uh, it, it caused even more instability. Um, further than this, in, a, in about 1900, is the Boxer Rebellion. And the Boxer Rebellion was a group of Chinese who wanted to essentially kick the Europeans and other foreign powers outside of China and, and kind of reclaim China for the Chinese. Um, the Boxer Rebellion also failed, um, not because it was unpopular, but because the imperialist forces were able to kind of join up and defeat the Boxers, uh, thus leading to even more humiliation and embarrassment on the part of the Chinese. So uh, that lends itself into 1900, which is where we end this time period. And the revolution of 1911, uh, which is what we're going to talk more about in the next unit of study that we look at. But essentially, this is the end of the Qing dynasty. And it was important because it brought China into um, the modern era, which is where they're now. Uh, moved them toward a republic. And my phone's ringing. This is bad. I got to go. You guys basically have the information that you have. I hope uh, that serves you well, and I will uh, talk to you guys later. Bye.